on the bow of this truck and it was playing We Are Sailing. The last time you see, not with the tannoy, it was, it was telling us how grateful I was and all like that. And as we left, there was these rows of Royal Navy ships doing red, and, red, white and blue smoke. And all the sailors like that as we went by, you know. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I told Chuddy again, I turned to Chuddy. I said, I didn't know you was emotional. He, was he said, you're going to see yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we just, it was just like a, a, a ferry, you know, like we did passengers at dinners on a night and breakfast in the morning. Um, we worked in the galleys six till, till we had a couple of hours off, didn't we, Mally? And then reverted back four o'clock, we started again till about nine o'clock at night. Marvellous. Oh, yeah. It was Holly Gullies, mainly. And Against the Wesley, the Wesley Yorkshire Lab. And Wesley, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was really nice, and it was one yeah. big happy family. Yeah. Um, I used to be playing the piano in the mess room, and they used to have lunch on board, and. It was really nice, yeah. lovely to, family atmosphere. I used to turn yeah. the cheese round for the passengers so I could... <laughs> Not to say the X. <laughs> we were on our way from Europort to Hull on the Friday night and I got the message about half past nine and uh, it said that when we got to Hull next morning we, would be, we were to discharge cargo passengers and then the ship was to be handed over to the MOD. And I got a real shock when I handed him the message. I'll never forget the look on his face. <laughs> she was ideal for the task. Uh, when the MOD requisitioned the ship, the, she was ideal uh, for loading uh, the, the paratroops and the stores to take them up to Ascension Islands. Because at that time it was the largest passenger ferry in the UK, sailing under the UK flag. And not only could it take about 1,200 passengers, but it could also take a lot of freight, which was obviously very useful for the MOD. Because they only wanted the best. <laughs> We're the best, aren't we? <laughs> it first came from Brian Lavender. He got the message as was coming down uh, from Rotterdam. And then from there, it went to Don Ellaby. And then Don Ellaby got all the crew and officers together in the restaurant and he explained what was happening to the ship. From there, he asked for volunteers and all the crew and officers uh, volunteered because it was one big family on the ship. We didn't want to leave each other. It was our ship, you know, you didn't want anyone else uh, taking it over. Yeah, exactly. Well, we were on the ship, it was our ship. I felt it was my duty to go. Mm. I must admit, as I said, well, I know it might sound a bit old fashioned, but what my father went through during the Second World War, when it came his son's turn to have a go, I felt I couldn't really let him down. That's the honest truth. Everybody was a bit shocked really for yeah. the first couple of days. Yeah. So, so we started getting the ship ready for a task in front of it. Yeah. I think it was a, a big deal for the married people, yeah, with families and children, you know, to tell your wife you, it could be possible you'd be going down south to Ascension Islands with a bunch of uh, paras and uh, all kinds of ammunition and that, you know. 
it's to explain to them that you, you won't be very long, you know. I think it was eight weeks originally. Yeah. When I was told to order all the stores. Yeah. The worst night was Portsmouth. That night in Portsmouth before we sailed. We all made a phone call home and that was it. I was glad when we sailed because we knew we'd bent our bridges then and that was it. And we'd on our way for whatever happens. <laughs> Well, the key was packed with families, friends, and yeah. whoever was there. It was, it, it was a good send off. Yeah. Well, I remember about the going away, it was, it was one of the hardest things to ever do is just let go. You know, all your families was there and waving goodbye. It was quite dark by then. And I remember the Norland slipping out with Roy on the back playing his piano. <laughs> there was the blokes waving to the wives and children. And uh, there was little kids crying on the quayside, which is only natural, mm. and that was sad. It was a bit of a carnival atmosphere. I'm on the old Joanna on the after end, but as we were sailing from the lock gates, it was eerie because you could see all the people just standing waving to us, and you're thinking to yourself, "Are we going to come back to see you?" You know what I mean? Yeah. And then when we left Portsmouth, with all the uh, paras. Uh, all the oh, wives and oh, children was there, weren't they, on the key side, and there was little lads dressed as pa little paras. And there was a band playing, Kiss Me, Goodnight Sergeant Major, and Argentina, and all like that, and Run Rabbit Run. Just went to the after end, and there was one of the other engineers who were there. And, I mean, I don't know, it was soon rather prophetic, but the sun was going down as well, it was in the sunset, you know, and I must admit, I, I, it was race, there was quite a few thoughts racing through in my mind, you know. I don't get melodramatic about it or anything of that nature, but we, we didn't, there was a slight possibility we were not be seeing it again, but... My wife just couldn't come to the, see the ship leaving, you know, she, she went home and uh, I went down and joined at midday, and then we sailed that night. Everybody was taking turns to make a last phone call home, you know, nobody was very happy. But I must have said before, I mean, leaving Portsmouth, we left with all the typical razzmatazz that the Royal Navy could lay on, but, um, yeah, I was glad that we'd got away, and that was it. Same as with, with the passengers, yeah. everybody got on. Yeah. Which Com was surprising, really. Yeah. Camaraderie was brilliant. Just had to get on, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they they realised that was a civilian crew, and there was no salute or anything, and calling you Sarah and that, you know. It's just the only problem we had was with the Royal Navy. Uh, the Royal Navy expected us to stand and salute them, you know. And uh, Don Ellaby uh, told uh, Espin Jones, he said, "We're a mixed Navy crew. We're civilians. And we don't salute uh, uh, your ranks." Well, there was the private. I mean, they're a bit psycho, aren't they? They're going to war. But uh, the officers, not the, the, the NCOs, was allowed in our bar. But they had two of the sergeants on the door, didn't they, John? So the, the privates couldn't get in. I remember when... So the private, we got to meet the sergeants and that. I remember the sunshine when they was out bronzing, and so many of them got bringing suntanned. <laughs> Come on, and there was burning. And what was his regimental name? Simpson? Simpson, yeah, yeah. And he had them running around the decks with the backpacks on. And you could see the bloody red backs and all this. And he'd just get gut anyway. He was a freaking ad bloke, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. It's strange when we was walking up yeah. and, and where you were the passengers. Yeah. And he's seen these big air chaps. Yeah. <laughs> and they've all got guns. Yeah. They're carrying with us yeah. all the time, 24 hours. They weren't allowed to put them down. He went to the toilet to take them with them. Yeah. And you're walking past and he said, would you like tea or coffee? And they've got a big rifle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it was brilliant. Yeah. Everybody gelled together. Oh, there was no... There was, no, there was a lot of mickey taking, but that was just the way things were on the ship. Banter. It was just banter. banter. Loads of banter all the time. I was on the, on the nights. Mm -hmm. We had to go on the night. The ship had to be split because the ovens, we only had six ovens that properly worked. 
and when we was baking light bread, it was in use 24 hours a day for other things. So we had to go into it. We did six to two, two to ten, ten to six. And it, it worked well. You, and your mate played a big part in it. Yeah. You've got to say that. I mean, if you didn't walk around with a smile on your face, yeah. there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Someone said, oh, it's one of the officers' birthdays in the sergeant's mess. He said, will you come and play to fetch the piano along? I said, all right, then. So I asked permission from the pairs from whatever, you know, because we was in our own quarters. I mean, it just snowballed from there. One minute I'm playing in the, the officers' mess for the sergeants, then for the squaddies in the continental lounge, and then the snook bar for the officers themselves. But lipstick and paint, I just, I just went for gold. I thought, well, just go for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they loved it. I think at first everybody was eyeing us. They thought we might be a bunch of pirates and they, we thought they were just a bunch of weekend sailors, you know. But once we started to gel, I think it went reasonably well. Oh, right. oh, we had rumours. We picked up rumours. I think I knew before we got to you, Ascension, that we were going to go further. But... Uh, you're not supposed to make things common knowledge. <laughs> well, to be, to be honest, we thought, well, that's it. They go off, and we come home. Mm. Nobody said it was going to go to Ascension, pick some more stuff up and go there for the year, yeah. up and down. Because yeah. we thought, right, we've done our job. <laughs> they didn't tell us that. General Julian Thompson came on board and said, ideal ship. For landing, uh, you go in further on. Will you please all write to Will? Will you? You got a phone call? Will you? You want to write any letters home? And uh, we'll go go further down. And then that's when things changed. Yeah, going down south to the Falklands, you know. And then when the Bell and Crown all got hit, we realised it was in. Uh, Bit of a sticky moment. And when we all volunteered, more or less, a few of the lads we were talking, I says, big pay rise here, and I says, we'll, we'll only go as far as Ascension Islands and we'll come back. Because we'll shoot ourselves. <laughs> little, to, little to us, we know when we left Ascension, <laughs> wasn't it? And the Sheffield got hit. And we thought, oh, it's for real. <laughs> I came down and what is the control room? These things propped up the back, didn't they? For the kind of, it was a photograph copy of a drawing of the Norman with an helicopter on the back and all those. Then all those, what's this, Jim? He said, oh, what were orders? Oh, right, let's have a look. And I think we were redesignated, weren't we? We were no longer, what were you, from, from a troop ship to an helicopter assault ship or something? Yeah. Hang on, you know, to, so, you know, things are changing and changing rapidly. They moved the, uh, the post three times. First was going to Ascension, then they said they was going 200 miles away from the uh, Falcon Islands and then get unloaded. Then it was change again, we were going in. And that's when it really hit more than anything yeah. then, we were going in. And with us being fair shipping, uh, as uh, Fozzie said on the uh, previous, we was on night so we was working. All the rest had to go and lay down. We continued working, and all the told us if, if we'd got hit a man, our legs had shattered, and we had to lay there until they can come and uh, sort us out. We got orders to stand down because the SAS have found a possible minefield, and it might the entrance to Fanning Head might have been uh, mined. So Julian Thompson and uh, Westwood, Admiral Westwood, decided that the Norland was expendable. She was only a ferry, <laughs> so we send the ferry in with two ageing uh, 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 ships called the uh, Intrepid and the uh, Fearless. Fearless. And the HMS Plymouth, who was just come out of a commission, she was going to be scrapped, so she went in. So they sent the four uh, ships in first, and we wondered, because I was on the bridge with uh, John Graham, we could hear the shells going over our heads, hitting different targets. I just remember uh, going off because I went on to the ascend and was looking up and just watching all the traces. And mm. then that was about what, four in the morning. But I remember when we first went in, it was the broadsword sailed alongside us mm. and shot the message that we were going in. Read ourselves, you see. But then we all had to uh, lay down on your beds or on your deck or something like that. 
because of man's, and said if you were a man or something, you said it could break every bone in your body. We got the orders to go in on the morning of the 20th, and uh, I think they played some stirring music over the tannery system, it was very RM type stuff, you know. All the pallets was getting ready for disembarkation, and uh, we was in the middle of uh, doing bacon sandwiches, weren't we? Mm. Bacon egg sandwiches for them. Because we wanted to make sure the paras had a meal. Although they had a dinner, we wanted to make sure they had a meal because when they got ashore, they would have to dig in. And it might have been 24, 36 hours. So it was just like a mother looking after the, children, uh, the kids. But we did it under total darkness. We were fully blacked out. And uh, there were night sights and stuff like that and issued off for the bridge, you know. And we were in a basic convoy. It was ships like the Amtrim and the Yarmouth and what not let us in. And when we got into the Falkland Sound, the LCUs from an Invincible came alongside Intrepid and we got them, the men out, the paras out through the shell doors and into the landing craft. And there were 900 or so got off with only one injured. As the two paras was disembarking, our Captain Ellaby was used to passengers, wasn't he? And he passed the ding dong. Mm -hmm. Ding dong. This is Captain Ellaby. I wish you all a safe journey and a safe, uh, safe onward, journey. On, onward journey. I will look forward to seeing you come back. But he didn't realise all the outside speakers was on. So it, you can imagine an Argentina sat there on his uh, corned beef sandwich and he hears ding dong. What the hell is going on here? It's a wonder we didn't get blown up before. The ferry's coming. Yeah, the ferry's coming, yeah. Defence site one, defence site one. Personnel not closed up, proceed by stairs to G-Deck. Personnel not closed up, proceed by stairs to G-Deck. Scary. Yeah. Everybody had to go down for some reason. And Peter bear me out here. We all had to go down to G deck. Yeah. And there was six of them in my cabin. <laughs> Pete, Pete being one of them. And I thought, well, why are we down here? Yeah. <laughs> they would last from about nine in the morning till five in the evening. It used to maybe be three at a time would come in. Red, red alert stations it was. And uh, you could see the aeroplanes coming down over the mountains and the hills and there was like little pinheads in the sky and next minute they used to fly over us drop the missiles and then fly over back to the mountains to Argentina because they only had enough fuel to get them back anyway like I say it wasn't a very nice experience and it was frightening They sent us down to G-Deck and when the first bombs dropped you felt the hole go like that and that was scary you know what I mean? Uh, you were unloaded ammunition during that air raid, mm. didn't you? Uh, yeah. Civilians that, yeah. unloading ammunition onto uh, uh, a landing craft during an air raid, and we all just carried on. Yeah. There's all these army lads with flash jackets and helmets and what, yeah, and wearing t-shirts and what. <laughs> tell you what I did, I, mean, I don't want to digress, but I remember I was in the engine room. There was a the one in the middle of an air raid, and a 500 pound bomb landed not so uncomfortably close. And you could feel it through your feet, but then there was a rattling on the ship's side, and I, could, I thought it was stuff that had been thrown up off the bottom. It was Elswin Jones who said it was superheated bubbles of water which was bursting on the ship's hull, you know, that, that evaporated in the explosion. It was, that was, yeah, it was. Uh, mm. Initially, we were told to go to G deck if there was an air raid on, but it didn't take any of us long to realise that that was one of the worst places to go. I mean, it would have been a death trap if something had dropped on top of us, you know. So everybody did their own thing and went to their own place. There was a, such a bang, and the whole ship seemed to bounce up and down about a few inches, you know. What the hell was that? So I rang the engine room, the chief engineer answered, he says, I think we've been hit, Derek, he says, you stay there and ring, we'll ring you back. 
Well, there I was in this steel box, 8,000 miles along, pacing up and down in this steel box, wondering if this could well be the end of the Beg dynasty. Anyway, it was the longest two or three minutes of my life until that telephone rang. Anyhow, he said, it's all right, there was an aeroplane blowing up above us. He says, they're just clearing the mess up now. Oh, I says, good, thanks very much, and put the phone down. <laughs> so we sneaked up onto sea deck and was on the back end of the ship again. And I went, freaking hell. <laughs> There was a frigging sky up right above us like that and I went on the undercarriage we went well I rubbed the door with he's on top of me like that went, oh and I'm frigging bruised yeah well that's when it got yeah. hit and she got she got blow up as well right above our heads no we were on top of him <laughs> and some of the shrapnel landed on the uh, on the well, helipad we're we're underneath him <laughs> right. you could actually see the power <laughs> yeah I was bruised and the missile it was well it was so long <clears throat> This missile was chasing it. And as it went mm -hmm. up, right near our ship, you see, to get away, because there was the big hills and all, as it went up, it just went whack. Underneath, yeah. it just come down like confetti. Well, there was a couple of evenings, you sort of thought to yourself, what's going to happen tomorrow? <laughs> but, you know, we were lucky we got through it. And, yeah. I was unloading the stores with the rest of the lads in a big then into the, L you know, the LCUs, the landing crafts, like, and I was this, the captain of it, this marine, he shouted through his, are you all crew? And I was right near the, I said, yo, you all are. He said, could you get somebody because this headline keeps breaking? And the, the landing craft kept coming off and banging, you know what I mean? So I went up top and I saw Shep the Boston. He said, right, but you'd have to come with me. I said, holy shit. We goes right up and on the sat on the sea deck, there was a companion away that went round onto the forecastle, down into the chain lock and where all the ropes was. But as we got onto this companion way, the antelope drifted by and blew up, right in front of us. When it got daylight and what have you, and you see the helicopters and the, you know, and then seeing the survivors after that. That's when reality hits you. Mm. You know, there's no ascension then. No, no. I, I, remember, I remember seeing it explode and all the Marines mm. were shouting, making us go back inside, but I didn't actually see it go up as well. Yeah. well I, it it sounds like you see it's it right on that yeah. it's, 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 That'll stay with me forever. Yeah, well, and it seemed to take ages for it to see. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, a long, long time. Long yeah, and then time. the next morning you see it with its back broke, don't you? Well, you see it like that, and the, you know, lift, you know, whatever there was, uh, helicopters and all like that. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, no, I think that was a bit traumatic. Yeah, it was a crazy time. In a sense, time, though, a crazy time. We it's ended up making beds. Yeah. Yeah. Making beds for them all. I remember that. Yeah. I yeah. think it was early hours in the morning, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Dropped lifeboats, took them off, brought them back on the ship. All the crew members was asked if we could give them clothing, which we did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we all gave them clothing. They went in the restaurant, in the cafeteria, and they all had a meal, and we looked after them. The first thing they did, they took them in the cafeteria, and they said, what, what can we do? Get the bloody tea going. So we've got tons and tons of tea, just yeah. to cool them down, you know, get them down. Then, of course, uh, once they got settled and they got changed and showered and everything, uh, right up to them by playing the piano. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even moan, I put my arms around them. <laughs> We'd gone round the ship though, yeah. and we went round every all the lads on the ship and just said, they got any socks, underpants, That's, yeah. shirts? Yeah, we were they were only what they'd come out of the water yeah. in. Yeah. So we, we'd give them all the, what we had, shoes, yeah. and there was, they, their officers were dishing them out to the lads. So then the gear there was taking off. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but they have nothing to do. I mean, the poor. Uh. It was all assessed when they came on, and, uh, and then they were sent to the accommodation after being interrogated. And uh, 
Going down to the first one in Pontaresas, uh, we had a load in the restaurant all laid out, uh, which was suffered from injuries and that, didn't mm. they? Yeah. And uh, the rest was all in cabins. At first, when we was taking them down south, they thought we was going to drown them all, uh, because the ones on the on the cardex uh, was containers, and they thought we was going to put them all in a container and shove them off the side. And they wouldn't refuse to eat and that, but uh, in the end, uh, managed to uh, tell them that we're here to look after them, you know, we're not going to harm them. Yeah, I had to call out my cabin on G-Deck, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, B -deck. yeah. yeah. all these. Yeah. I think there was four to a cabin on G-Deck, wasn't there? Yes, there was, yeah. Four, two beds, yeah. two bunks. Yeah. Four, four prisoners of war to a cabin. It was in a bad way. Yeah, full of scabs and everything. Because yeah. they didn't, didn't get the food, you see. All the officers was eating like kings. There was trek like rubbish on them lads. And at the end of the day, it was, uh, they, when they came on board, it was in groups, sat on the car decks, and it was going down to the showers on G-deck. And uh, as Richard said, there was, um, you know, making them to get a shower, tidy themselves up. And there was, there was one squaddy, one Argentinian, uh, he had this rucksack on his back, and uh, he wouldn't take it off his back. So anyway, this, I think he was a Marine, he made him take it off his back, and I didn't see it myself, but it, it did happen. Uh, he had his dead brother's remains in, in the this sack. rucksack. Yeah. 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 The prisoners come on board, they had a lot of food. They, believe it or not, they had a lot of food mm. in the satchels, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. And we took it off them and we used to make a stew with it, didn't we? And put yeah. it in the big boilers. Yeah. And that's what we, we fed them a lot of their own food back, actually. Because mm. we were surprised how much they actually had. In the, also, in the, in when, the we bags. Do, when we were doing the cooking, before we went out to the prisoners, mm. this Lieutenant Commander comes from Royal Navy. He come and tasted it to make sure it was fit for them. Yeah. Part of the Geneva Convention. Yeah, that's right. I really changed everybody. I don't like silence. Uh, and I think that's from when we took the two power off and the ship went flat and everybody was quiet. And now I've got to have music on. I think yeah. everybody had, had different experiences of it. Didn't it didn't you? affect you, there was yeah. something wrong with you, I mean, yeah. in them yeah. area yeah. wardens, if, if yeah. you wasn't yeah. frightened, yeah. you would tell it a lie. Because yeah. it was frightening, yeah. no matter what anybody said. Was. I do believe that everybody thought, we're going, we're going, we're going to get it. You know what I mean, that's for our silver, all right? And I tried to put it on my mouth, but get it is. And that yeah, I it. think it, a lot of, well, I'd say the biggest, biggest majority of us was uh, frightened oh, yeah. sometime or other. I say we're not... <clears throat> but I think the best one when it came over, as we was coming back from, was it, uh, when was it the first time we took the prisoners? Yeah, to Montevideo. Montevideo, and when we was sailing back, mm -hmm. and the white flag had been arisen. And the Arias came out in front of us doing victory rolls, and then on the, on the speakers, what was it, Royal Britannia and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah. Coming over, and that's when tears was yeah. everybody's eyes. <clears throat> like I say, you get your good days, your bad days in life. Everybody does, but mm. um, you still have memories there. It's yeah, still, you, you you're not flashbacks. You you, 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 you sat, and something will come up on telly, or yeah. it is something. It or brings back your memories. Even a chum, and yeah. you go, yeah, Phew. and you know exactly who was sat with, and who you, who you, what you was talking about, yeah. and it does really, yeah. And if, I've got to say this: the thing it does make you wonderful, is how good all them armed forces was. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I know it's into rivalry, yeah. regiment, but how they all work together. Yeah. And what they deserve, they deserve a lot more than they're getting now. Yeah. Because they're brilliant. They're brilliant, really good lads. And lasses, yeah. some lasses oh, as well. Oh, the lasses as well, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, things are, tend to be before Falklands and after Falklands. Yeah. You know, it, it's, there's that sort of line in your life. I don't think we got what we should have deserved, to be quite honest, because we were out there that long, and like Fozzie said, when we came back, we didn't, we, we didn't get the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Recognition. Like, recognition. Recognition, yeah, that we should have got. I think all the glory was turned out of the big box. Definitely. I, I think myself, just my own opinion, was left there down so long. Yeah. Not in the uh, in the state because we're doing doing a good job. It's just that when we got back home, a lot of it all been forgotten. Mm. 
I mean, the, the Norland, a lot of people forget, she must be actually one of the last ships to come back from yeah, the task yeah, force. Yeah. I mean, she was out there the best part of, well, not far short of a year, I mean, mm. and she was, she was too handy, that was the problem. Yeah. They used it as transport between Ascension and the Falkland Islands. In maritime history, Norland is up there bigger than the Canberra. Um, for what she did because she not only was a troop ship but she did a lot of uh, things which wasn't unescorted. When we went down to Gritviken to pick up the uh, Gurkhas uh, in uh, Gritviken, uh, we had no escort and we had the whole trawlers there and whole trawler, yeah. Yeah, the camera. The QE2 came scurrying in, dropped all the Gurkhas and the three commando brigade off and then she disappeared again. To a rapturous welcome hall. We were still out there. I've got we? a photograph of the Kiwi, so it's I mean, all yeah. trolls along the but it's in the yeah, album. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, Norland is uh, well respected in whole, whole maritime, and I was certainly make sure the officers and crew in Norland are never forgot. We did what was expected of us, and I think we did it reasonably well, but that's what all the communities said, I think. Mm.